Okay, so let's get on. I'd like to today, my hope is to quickly finish up stuff about hidden Markov models and then start to get into the next topic, which is um, going to be microarray analysis. Let me turn down the light a little bit. I think that's better. Okay. Um, I should pick, pick that up. Get, get that done. Okay. So um, what do we know about hidden Markov models now? What we should believe from last time. What I'd like to claim is, um, we, we, the, the, the following is basically what I'd like to claim we know about hidden Markov models. We have this idea that hidden Markov models are um, networks of states, okay, where there's transitions based on symbols, that uh, it is a non-deterministic automata, meaning that on one symbol, the transition to the next state is not necessarily fixed. Okay, there can be two different states you can go to. Okay, and that what state you go to is a function of a transition probability from this state. So on a C, with some probability I'm going to go here, with some probability I'm going to go over there. And our goal is then to basically use various ways of interpreting um, this model on a particular string as to determine what the labels of the hidden states are. In the case of a model like this, we have positive states, meaning in the CG island, let's say, negative states, meaning outside the CG island. The question of whether you're in, you're, you're, yes, a part of the string is in a CG island or not depends upon whether it's basically being labeled going through positive states or negative states. And we've discussed several ways, that you, a couple of ways at which you might annotate, given a model like this where you have transition probabilities, okay, and, you know, uh, as a function of the string character, the, the, the next character in the string, we discussed a couple ways where you might take a string and annotate it with these hidden states by doing things like, for example, finding the most highest probability path. That was the Viterbi algorithm, right? Find the highest probability path to the, the automata. And let the, the, depending upon which states you visit on it, would label which parts of the string are positive and which parts of the string are not positive, are, are negative, okay, or CG island or non CG island, okay? And we discussed other models, but, uh, ways you might be able to do it. If you know what you really want to know is what is the probability over all paths that the string is in it, uh, over all paths interpreting a particular string that it's in a, a particular state at a particular time. And that, I argued, with some hand-waving, okay, is basically the result of computing what's the probability to a str uh, uh, the state times the probability we can get from this state to a successful conclusion, okay? And that based on that, you could identify what the most highest probability state is for any string. And that gives you another, uh, another way of annotating. But basically, our vision here is that we've got an automata, we've got um, you know uh, algorithms to compute the most popular state or the probability of be, uh, the, the highest probability path, or the probability of being in each state at a particular time, and based on that, we can label the string. Any questions about that? That I think is the clear vision, and if that's not clear, that's what we should discuss. Any questions about that? How many people think that is a clear vision? Okay, how many people don't think it's a clear vision? Okay, so let's talk a little bit more just about, I'd like to try to wrap up some of the other issues with hidden Markov models. I think that's the basic idea of how they work. Um, there are a few things that we haven't, uh, that I, th a few issues that I've glossed over that uh, we should talk about. Um, one that thing that came up that is a question of how do we train a hidden Markov model, okay? Training, as far as I'm concerned, is this problem basically of setting the weights. As a, as a model designer, you presumably came up with what the system of states are and what the illegal transitions are. But what, let's say, is the thing to learn once you set the topology of the model, okay, is really what these edge transition probabilities were. And last class, there was a question where how do you get these things, okay? Um, and I tried to explain it by saying, well, 
If I give you a bunch of input examples, okay, each of which is annotated by, um, like, let's say in this case, uh, we have the uh, which parts are out of the are in the non-CG, which parts are CG, okay, which parts are not. I claim that you could look at these and compute a priori statistics of how often each transition would occur, okay. And this, I think, was somewhat convincing, right? It should be clear that if I have enough training data, I would be able to figure out is how often is the end of a CG island, okay? Does it go to a C? Does it go to a G? Does it go to a T, right? Now, there are a couple problems with that, okay? Does everybody, everybody gets the idea that, in principle, if you have to estimate it like that, that gives you a way to do it. But in general, I'm glossing over a couple of things that are more complicated. One is to note that the amount of training data you have is usually very small, okay? If, in, in the way we think about it, each one of these training sequences was a biologist um, going to say, this is a CG island, this is where it starts, this is where it ends. And, you know, it may be that this, you know, we would like to go to the biologist and say, okay, give me 100,000 examples, okay? But, but the biologist can't annotate that many, okay? One is because one takes a certain amount of work. Second is, you know, they may not know of that many examples to begin with, okay? There may not even be that many in the database. If they knew how to recognize 100,000 of them, what do they need you to have a program for it? It's another way to think about it, right? So we live in a world where the data is in general relatively expensive, training data is relatively expensive. And trying to compute it on, um, what you call it, on the statistics carefully are probably a difficult thing. How many parameters did our model have? That's another way to look at it. Let's look at our simple CG, non-CG island model. Oops, let me kill this thing. How many parameters here were there to train on if we stop to think about it? Okay, we've got something like there are eight states, each of which can go to any other one. Is that right? So what is eight choose two? Okay, eight, 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 I, can, I, I don't know how to do this, right? Eight times seven divided by uh, two, is that right? Now that was 56 divided by uh, two, that was 28. Does everybody agree with that? So trying to estimate these 28 parameters from a small number of examples seems like a risky thing to do. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm kind of imagining if I were doing the CG Island training business, Probably you can get the biologist to maybe give you 100 examples. Probably there are very few, maybe only about one CG island or a small number of CG islands or transitions per example. To try to learn 28 parameters from this is a challenging thing. Does everybody get that idea? And estimating it statistically will be, be kind of a rough thing. So just these counting and identifying these, these, these transitions a priori it's not a trivial thing. Um, the other thing to note is that in a more complicated model, okay, there may be states that we want in our bi model that the biologist didn't really train for, okay. So if I kind of picture it, maybe, um, maybe not, not, you know, I'm kind of picturing. Let's say that we had a more complicated model where there was a. Uh, we, we had some states capturing an idea that I'm just going to make up now of some kind of a speed bump approaching the end of a, a CG island. Let's say that there was a world where there was some kind of a world where we, we, we thought CG islands had the property, let's say, that they were denser in the middle, okay, and less dense on the side, as I'm now making up as we go along, but it could very well be the case. Let's say that that, that, that was a, a characteristic of CG islands. Then we would probably want more parameters, a different set of, of parameters, states. You'd like to say in a CG island would be you're in a CG island at the beginning, you go to a middle state, you go to the end state, okay? And that you might want to have that these parameters equals those parameters. Uh, but the point is that the, the biologist might very well not want to mark up for you what is the beginning and end of uh, the, the, the intermediate bump of a CG island? That would be something you'd have to determine, 
Okay? And so the question is basically if they will tell you, okay, the fine structure of the training examples, exactly what part of the training example corresponded to exactly what state of the model, then you could estimate the transition probabilities the way that we talked about, by just counting. Okay? Now, if not, what we really have is the following. You've got um, a model that, let's say, where you initially set certain parameters based maybe on the statistics you gathered or your idea about how the world should work. Like in CG Islands, there's got to be more CGs. Okay? And so you'll make that thing higher. The other class of, of um, th th there's classes of, of tr training algorithms that basically will try to infer these parameters. And usually these things are basically iterative algorithms. The idea would be you start out with a set of weights that make sense to you, maybe from your background knowledge, maybe from some kind of, an, you know, some kind of estimate of, the, of, of, of looking at the model. And then you run each training sequence through the model. Okay? What you would hope is, if you, your model is good, if this is a CG, if, you're tr if your model is, okay, I don't quite know what's happening here. If your model is good, okay, let's say that we had a world where there was a CG island here and there. What we would like to see happen when we tr did, let's say, the Viterbi algorithm on, on one of the training sequences, we would like to think that it rattled around the non-CG islands, came around here, rattled around there, and then came out. Okay? What an iterative algorithm would do would be to say, okay, let's take your, now that we have an initial model, let's run all the training sequences through it, and then see what it did. And if, for example, we find that uh, instead it, it jumped out over here and came back over there, the question would be, how can we adjust the weights so it does better on this example? That kind of makes sense as the basic idea of what you would want the training algorithm to do. You have weights. You know what the answer should be. You now take your examples and run them through the model again, okay? And then adjust the probabilities so that it makes the transitions that would give you the right answer, okay? So in this case, if we add... Well, uh, um, uh, something that jumped out of the CG model state here, island here, and it shouldn't. Maybe we'll say, well, why did it take that edge instead of this edge? Maybe we could pop up the uh, value of one of the probabilities to make it less likely to jump out, okay? And if we keep doing this over and over again, the hope is that our model will get better and better, okay? So there are a couple of different training algorithms, which I'm not going to go through in any detail that basically work this kind of an idea, okay? The Turby algorithm, okay, uh, learning method. What we would do is we would take the, um, what you call it? We would um, take our model. Once we know what the um, right annotation is, we know we'd want this path to be the strongest path. <coughs> and if it isn't, we adjust the weights to try to make it the strongest path. Or alternately, there's something called the Baum-Welsh algorithm that w tries to learn it so that it will <coughs> give us the right answer under the, the, the state, the highest probability state um, <coughs> scoring system. Okay? But basically, these go through, they take the training examples, run through, iterate on the parameters, and keep doing this until either the probabilities converge, okay, meaning that you know, the, the parameters stop changing, okay? Or we find that we are classifying enough models right, enough of our input examples that we're happy with it. Any questions about that? I know that is vague, but does that basically make sense as to how these things should work? Any questions about learning in these things? Okay? So the real question then is, how you know, there are a couple of issues that come up in... Um, in training these things. Actually, probably the, one of the most important issues that comes up is something called overfitting. One problem when you try to build an, a, a uh, model from a small number of examples is that the model will get very, very good at predicting your examples, okay? And, you know, in fact, too good at predicting your examples, okay? 
So we kind of could imagine a world where, you know, if I took a look at, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's say I want to fit a function. Here's a function of where I have 29 points where I want to pass through, right? If I wanted to find a, uh, uh, it was a time series. If I wanted to find a function that uh, fit those 29 points very well, one way I could do it is by building a 29-degree polynomial. Does everybody agree with that? What would a 29-degree polynomial look like through this? We'll probably use something like this. Okay. With 29 um, degrees of freedom, you have enough, um, what you call it, freedom to go and pass through every one of these points. Does everybody agree with that? So if your criteria is how well did I predict the input trading examples, this model does a great job, okay? But it's not going to be very robust. It's sort of overfitting. It's learning all the weirdnesses of what we're doing. We're a much better model for this might very well be something that just looked like this. Everybody agree with that? And so there's, you know, so the problem is when you have a lot of dimensions, okay, and a small number of, and, and a, a, a lot of parameters and a small number of training examples, you have to guard against too closely predicting your data. And one technique that people do that's kind of interesting is that you um, take each training set example and add random noise to it, okay? So maybe you give me a CG Island mod, uh, annotation from the biologist. And every once in a while, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to take this thing, and instead of running it through my system, maybe I'm going to shift the boundaries of it a little bit, okay? You could kind of imagine that if, uh, you know, the biologist has given me, this is where the CG Island is. That's one training example. Maybe if I gave a lot of training examples that were fairly similar, maybe this, and this, and this, and this, okay, it will still capture the idea of CG Island models without sort of focusing on one example. Now there are a lot of examples in a family. If you could add random noise in an intelligent way to it, okay, then the claim is that you will um, avoid overfitting. Any questions? Any questions about what the problem of overfitting is? Everybody see that that would be a real problem when you have a small number of examples, okay? And various things need to be done to deal with that. Any questions? Now, in designing a, a, a hidden Markov model, the topology, this, the network of states that you use, is I think probably the most important deci design decision you need to make, okay? Is that you, know, you don't just go around saying that you have a certain number of states that you want to learn. Usually based on your problem, there is going to be some logical system of states that reflect what is really going on, okay? So for example, if we think about, let's say, building a uh, hidden Markov model, to try to recognize genes, okay? Genes are, you know, in, in, in are, you know, um, more fairly complicated things, okay? But there's typically an upstream region. There's a start codon. There's a stop codon. There's coding sequences, okay? Instead of building one model to recognize genes it's probably good to think of it in terms of smaller models that recognize different things. So this is probably what I would consider if I were going to be doing a gene finding, building a hidden Markov model that might recognize genes. I would expect the structure of it to look something like this, okay? There is going to be a promoter site that, let's say, has to have a TATA -TA thing, right? And there is some region upstream of it. Okay, that really doesn't belong to the gene at all. Okay? There is going to be some kind of a promoter region between the first signal and the start of gene symbol. Okay? The ATG. Okay? And this probably has different statistics than this or within genes. In general now, then once we start a gene, we're going to be in an exon. We're going to have a 
go through a bunch of exon states until we hit a donor site that leads us into an intron. We'll then be in an intron mode, okay, which will then end with an acceptor site, which brings us back to another exon. Does that make sense? And when we finally are finished with the gene, the gene is going to end in some way. It's going to end in a stop symbol, okay, and then there's going to be all the downstream stuff that we don't care about. Logically, this is the structure of what a gene model would be. Does this make sense? And the right way to build a hidden Markov model for this thing would be that we would have a certain number of states to encode the upstream region. Okay? How many states might we have? Okay? You know, I you know, don't know. Maybe an upstream region might be a history of one base character before that, right? Yeah? Three. So you could make the, the other features that you might have, okay? So there's other, other possible signals that you might have, right? Okay? But the basic vision here is this now captures more of the logical structure of what a gene is, okay? And what I claim is that the right way to do this is a composition of smaller models representing different features. Does everybody get that idea? So how many states might this model have? I might say that uh, the upstream region depends upon the history of how long a memory you want to have of having been in it. Maybe I would have one, four states was the last thing an ASC, a G, or a T, right? And maybe that might cover the upstream region thing, right? In the promoter region, maybe I'm going to have a similar thing. Maybe I'll have four states. Maybe I'll have a longer memory, okay? Three, you know, uh, four states by however much of a memory I want to have. And I'd have a, a sort of a little automata here, okay? Looping around, okay, and transitioning among itself. Within the exons, if we look at the CGLN case there again, we only had basically four states. In Ron, we had four states. The downstream thing, maybe we would have four states here to denote this thing. And now the question is, what kind of transitions are allowed? Well, at each of these little automata, I can either stay in my mode or advance to the next state. I'm not going to allow you to jump from the promoter region to an exon. Does that make sense? It's got to go through this symbol first, okay? And what I now claim is, if you build a model and you train it on this thing, now the highest probability sequence through this model, if you give me an input sequence, okay, there is some hope that the input, that the highest probability path through the model captures the structure of the gene, okay? Any questions about that? Okay. What the topology is doing is really fixing that, that there are certain pairs of states that you can't transition between, right? The topology is saying there is no direct transition from here to there, okay? What that's really doing is setting the transition probability to zero, okay? And the more edges that we know, the transitions that we have set to zero, the fewer things we have to learn. And the fewer parameters we have to learn, the more likely it is we're to learn them successfully. Any questions about that? Okay, yeah. What is TATA stands for? TATA, this is a TATA box. It's one of these things that, that, uh, that uh, you know, that, um, you know, it's, it's one of these, I, I consider it sort of part of the promoter region. It's probably the most famous of the bind, promoter binding sites. Okay, this is one of the, 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 the molecules that starts um, translation, basically binds to this thing. Okay? And so this is a fairly strong feature. Most upstream regions in certain species will have this. Okay? And so that's, that's, why, that's why if we know that that's a feature of these things, we could have it maybe learn that, bot, that sequence. Okay? Or we could sort of have that explicitly as a molecule. So that darn it, we're only going to consider a place where we have recognized the Tata box. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, so this model you still say has a lot of parameters. 
Okay? The answer is there are a lot of parameters. How would you set it? Well, maybe what you would say is things like the upstream and, re and downstream region. If you're saying you don't like too many parameters, how might we reduce that kind of thing? One might be with some a priori knowledge, right? It seems to me that, for example, the upstream and downstream regions I consider to be anything that's not a gene. Upstream and downstream are probably have similar statistics, right? So if you think there's too many parameters to learn, maybe you would want to share the parameters. So the parameters in this part, part of the model are exactly the same as that model, right? Or maybe you would say you don't even want a history of four states. Maybe there's only going to be one state, OK? And that you don't remember whether the previous character was something. But just that this is going to be either an ACG or T can either go back this way, and on a T I will go here, on an A I'll go here, on a C and a G. Okay. Now I'm down to four parameters here. The probability, well, the probability of the go, I guess really actually two parameters. What is the probability on a T of moving forward versus staying where I am? Okay. So if you're in a battle where you want to learn as few parameters as possible, you can do that by fixing parameters based on a priori knowledge, or better than that, fix fixing um, the topology of your model to better understand that. Any questions? Okay. Um, anyway, that's basically what I said. So basically, to reduce these things, you want to force certain parameters or combine them okay, to try to reduce what you're trying to think about. Any questions? Okay? So I recognize this is still, you know, somewhat vague. But the basic idea is you should see that you can fix a topology. There's parameters. To, you use a training algorithm. Hopefully good things will happen. Okay? Any questions? So are hidden Markov models good things? Okay? Or would you be better off, you know, designing things from scratch? Okay? An a priori algorithm. That's what I kind of think about it. In general, Building what I'll call an ad hoc model. Ad hoc means for this problem only is the way I think about it. So in one case, is if, if I had a biologist tell me a very convincing definition of what a gene is, okay, and how you should recognize them, building a custom handcrafted program to recognize genes according to that model is a great idea. Okay? But it depends that that means understanding what I'm doing. That I have to have a clear definition of what a gene should look like if I'm going to recognize it by me building a program. Hidden Markov models tend to be very, very good okay, at solving problems, even if you don't understand what you're solving, provided you have sufficiently good examples. So if I'm good at uh, you know, building hidden Markov models, and I want to segment Chinese addresses, into um, different parts. So like, I mean, in America, you know, addresses have a name. They have a uh, street, right? They have a number. They have a street. They have a city. They have a uh, state. And they have a zip code. Does that make sense? So if I give you an address, in principle, there's a segmentation problem that needs to be solved to do that, to properly parse this thing, right? Suppose someone gave me a bunch of addresses in Chinese, okay, and they didn't tell me anything about Chinese, but they had accurately marked up what was the name, what was the street, what was the city, what was the state, and what was the zip code. I'm assuming Chinese addresses have this property. I don't know. But if you give me enough training examples of this, then the claim is that I should be able to build an address segmenter model. Okay, without knowing anything about Chinese. Does that make sense? I will learn nothing about Chinese in the course of doing this model, right? But on the other hand, if you give me enough examples that are representative of the kind of uh, addresses that you would see in practice, I expect this model would do a good job of segmenting it. Any questions? So hidden markup models are good if you have no idea about what you're solving, but you have very good training data. Okay. And the good thing is that they can be brought online very quickly. If a custom model requires 
a computer scientist really understanding what your problem is and learning about how genes are regulated and things like that. It takes a long time to build them. If, on the other hand, you can use a built-in package that, tra that trains hidden Markov models, okay? In principle, you can bring these things very up very quickly, and that is the advantage of these ad hoc models. Any questions? Now, there are a lot of these sort of AI learning-based models that uh, that are you know that people use again in, in sequence analysis hidden Markov models tend to be popular because there typically is this left to right structure you're moving through sequences sequences sort of you can kind of think of sequences naturally segment into regions and so that 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 um, that idea seems to be captured by Markov models very very well okay. So hidden Markov models are good things because they're based on our, you know, our natural mathematical formalism that makes sense. And if your problem is naturally is modeled by a Markov process, basically like, like you know, that, 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 that there is a difference between one set, what happens to sequence probabilities in one segment of the sequence than another, this does a good thing. Any questions about hidden Markov models, why they're a plausible thing? Okay. Now, one thing that's true about any model that you build is it is very important to validate it properly. So this has to go with hidden Markov models or any other kind of a learning technique that you apply. One thing that you can often do, okay, what a bad person will do, is they will have a bunch of training examples, okay, and then build a custom, all their training examples build a uh, custom hidden Markov model, okay, to recognize these training examples. Run those training examples through the model that they built. Note that they classified almost all of them correctly and say my model is 75% accurate because of my four training examples, three of them I got right. What is the sin that is being committed here? Okay. If anyone understood what I said well enough to recognize the sin. The sin is really that, that often that people try to evaluate their model on their training data. And this is kind of the sin that gets happened. <coughs> if you um, use your training data <coughs> as, as uh, how well you do on your training data on, um, you know, how, how well you accurately you recognize your training data as a measure of how good your model is, you're crying out to sort of overfit your model. Does that make sense? You're learning what is weird about these particular cases so you can get a high score on them. Okay? That's fine. That's what training sort of does. But in order to recognize whether your model is good, you need to somehow validate it in a sensible way. What would be a reasonable way to validate it? Yeah? So one idea is to reserve a certain amount of the training data, okay, to validate it, okay? Now what is the, what, so the good thing to do is you have some out of sample data. You train on this fraction and then you evaluate it on this. If you overfit, you're certainly going to recognize that. Does that make sense? Because now you've got completely new instances. You can't fake it the way you could have if you tried to train it and then evaluate it on the data that you trained. Now, what's the problem, though, with setting aside a fraction of the data? Okay? Yeah? That data is not represented by the model. Well, one pro possibility is that data is not represented by your model. That's only a problem if you don't have enough training data to begin with. And the only problem is that's usually the case, right? So, you know, if you set aside 10%, let's think about it. If you set aside 100, if you have 100 training instances, if you set aside 10% of them, as you suggested, that would represent, you mean you've got 10 sequences of how well you're doing. It's not clear to me you get a statistically relevant sense as to how well you're doing from only 10 examples, right? I would probably want to set aside 30 or 40% of my examples for validation. The trouble with that is now my training set six, six to 60, okay? So when you've got sparse training data, Setting aside a fraction of your training examples is a bad thing, you know, is a, is a problem. It's better than setting aside nothing, 
because then you have no idea how good your model is. Does everybody see the problem? There is one clever idea that, uh, that people use, okay, which is uh, very useful in small data situations. Something called, um, basically, leave one out cross-validation, okay? One possibility is to take your 100 training examples, okay, and set one of them aside, okay? Train on these, hundred these 99 remaining examples, and then predict the last one, okay? And you're either going to get it right or wrong, right? So that gives you either your model is going to get 0 or 100 percent, right? But what do you then do? Then go and do something different. Instead now, retrain the model on another, uh, uh, pick a, the second sequence and leave that one out. Retrain the model on just these remaining 99 examples. Again on this one, you will either get it right or wrong. Does everybody see that? The claim is if you build these hundred models, each of these hundred models will have the property that they were trained on 99 sequences. And you have a hundred sort of independent tests as the out of sample tests as how far as how you did. Does that make sense? And so this gives you a way that you can sort of amplify the amount of training data you have to use it on assessment. Any questions? That would give you a hundred models. Which of these hundred models should you choose? Okay, let's say that we find that we do this thing and we get 90% accuracy. Which of these should we choose? Okay, so you're saying that I, maybe what I should do is keep all hundred models, run my new sequence through all hundred models, and then vote, yeah. right? That would be one way to do it, but that seems like a lot of, you know, if I have to use this for high volume thing, that seems like a problem. What would be the best model to use? If I have to come up with one single model. Yeah? I would say once I've proven that in principle, I can get 90% from this kind of thing, why don't I retrain it all on, on all the examples? And I claim that is probably going to be the most reliable model, right? In principle, the more training data I have, the better I should be getting, right? So if you've proven to me that 99%, uh, that basically 99 examples is enough to get good performance, then presumably if I trained on all 100 examples, I will get good performance, okay? And that's probably the model that I would use, okay? Your, mo your idea of keeping multiple models around seems reasonable, okay? Although, again, I think picture is being expensive evaluate. Any questions? Okay. So that's probably how I would go and do these kind of things. Any questions? So the good thing about it is, again, if you give me any training examples, and again, validating these things is important. If you give me any set of uh, training examples, I can build models to recognize it. So one thing that people like to do for a hobby is take as input time series is of stock prices, okay? And they will try to say, when did the stock price go up and down, right, based on the previous history? And then they will try to uh, use this to predict where the stock prices will go up. Does everybody get that idea? You can build a model, determine whether you're either in, in the going to go up, you know, have hidden states for going to go up, going to go down, going to stay the same, right? And you could build, take a lot of past stock market prices and build these things. In general, these models do a great job of predicting the past, okay? But often there is no signal to actually predict the future. If you could predict the stock, stock prices, you would be rich. Somebody else would have already done it. They would have been rich, and stock prices would have moved already. So there really isn't, in fact, a good model for this, okay? If you don't validate it on fresh data, a lot of people are fooled into thinking they have great models because they're great at predicting the past data that they're given, okay? But you need out-of-sample tests, and these things usually go away. Any phenomena you see go away the moment you bring in out-of-sample data. Any questions? 
So the basic thing with all of these learning models that is an important thing is that there is a garbage in, garbage out rule. How good your model is is a function of how good your training data is and how carefully you validate it. And there's all kind of horror stories about people who tried to build models and not properly validated it because that data was bad. My favorite was this computer vision system I heard about where they tried to build a, a, um, a uh, classifier that would take a picture of a vehicle and try to decide whether it was a car or a truck. And they, you know, basically built this system and on the images that they had, they had a phenomenal result. They were very almost perfectly accurate at classifying a car image from a truck image. And then they put it into the field and it no longer worked. And the reason it turned out was that the day they took the, the, the f car photographs, it was cloudy. And so what the system was learning, it learned basically that the, what was a car was something that had a cloudy background, okay? And this is the kind of thing that can happen if you've got a, a system that's really, there's a lot of parameters, you can't really look into your parameters with what you're doing, right? All you can do is you can see it's giving you predictions. You have to sort of validate what you're doing, okay, or else the model will have meaning. Any questions about that? Okay, any questions about these models? Okay. That said, hidden Markov models are an important thing. And they're important for a lot of things in computational biology and in, you know, in, in all kinds of pattern recognition. Several problems that we will, you know, we either will talk about or could talk about in here are, are addressed by um, hidden Markov models. One particular problem, just to give you an idea of a related thing. We'll talk, hopefully, in about a, a couple weeks about protein structure prediction. But um, this is, has to do with figuring out what the shape of a protein is. Um, the secondary structure of a protein is a very, very coarse description of its shape. Parts of it form these helical things. Parts of it form these flat regions. And part of it form these loops that nobody cares about. And so one part of um, protein prediction is I give you the protein sequence, the 20 base letter amino acid sequence of a protein. And you'd like to determine which parts of it are in helices, which parts of it are in sheets, and which parts of them are just in strands or loops. And this is really this problem of assigning one of three letters, you know, helix, sheet, or loop to um, each one of the N amino acids. And now we can think of basically building a hidden Markov model, right? Three hidden states. You can, something can be in a helix, something can be in a sheet, something can be in a loop. You give me enough a examples that are annotated by what their secondary structure is. <coughs> I can now talk about building an automata that tries to assess, based on the sequence content around it, which state should I be in. And these kind of models are very effective at secondary structure prediction. Any questions? <coughs> any kind of a, we talked about you know, gene prediction, any kind of a sequence world where there's features that represent linear um, sequences, where the features represent contiguous regions on, uh, in a sequence, tend to be the kind of things you would want to do in a hidden Markov model. Hidden Markov models are used a lot in speech processing. Why? Because in speech, you know, there's sort of what matters in trying to recognize what my next word is. It doesn't matter so much what happened a hundred words ago. It only matters on what I just said in the pre previous few syllables. Okay? And there's kind of a local context to these things. And you can imagine that each, you can imagine building a model where um, you have as input a s bunch of sampled speech, okay, signal. You have um, different states representing different phonemes. Your goal is, given this thing, try to align the speech signal to the phoneme model to figure out what symbol you meant out. Any questions? So all these segmentation problems tend to be things you can do with hidden Markov models. Okay? Any questions about these models or anything like that? People want more details about how these models work. I encourage you to uh, look at the um, lecture notes, the, uh, the notes that I put on the, uh, what you call it, uh, on, on the web, okay? I mean, that I, I took the from MIT as well. 
any qu my lecture notes, but also these extra notes that I attached on the thing page. Any questions? Okay. What I would like to do now is um, start a transition to a different topic. Okay. So normally I'd start a different lecture now, but we, we've been a little bit behind. So I'd like to change directions. Any questions more about gene prediction or hidden Markov models or pattern recognition, any of these kinds of things before I change direction? Because this is going to be a, a, a different topic. Yes? What's a hidden Markov model? What is a hidden Markov? OK, good. OK. Any other questions? OK. Possibly more advanced questions. <laughs> OK. <laughs> any questions? OK. So what I'd like to talk about now is a, uh, is, um, a sort of completely it's a completely different um, kind of problem, a different sort of state of uh, biological knowledge. Let's think, um, you know, in computational biology, we want to understand different aspects of biological systems. You know, if we think about where we started, you know, if we think of the history of the course so far, in the beginning we had this idea that there was a genome and we wanted to learn what it was and we had to work very, very hard to figure out what the sequence was, okay? Okay, just, just a raw pattern of A, C, Gs, and Ts, right? The next thing we wanted to be able to do, if we had something interesting in a database of these things, we wanted to find where something was on these raw strings. Okay, and that helped us. We just talked about gene prediction. And gene prediction will now tell us where all the genes are on that sequence. Okay? So this is good in that all this... Is are sort of these genes are somehow the pro describing the proteins as the parts that we're made out of. The trouble is that um, to describe the state of a biological system, you need to know more than the parts list. You need to know something about what has you know what is going on, okay, in the system. So, for example, one interesting example is everybody has seen a uh, butterfly. Does everybody agree there's a butterfly? <laughs> okay? Oh, yes. Yeah. Everyone knows that butterflies come from what? Caterpillars, right? And these are these worm-like things that look like this. Okay? Now, genetically, in terms of its genomic DNA sequence, what is the difference between a butterfly and a caterpillar? The answer is absolutely nothing, right? Yet all of us have an intuitive sense that there is something that is different, right? Okay, and it is pretty clear, that, so, so if it's not the genomic sequence that's changing, it's not the, um, what you call it, it's not the set of proteins that it can possibly make, which are the genes, it really has to do with at what, what proteins were being made where at what stage of the organism's life. Does everybody get that idea? So somehow there's a certain level of dynamicism, dy dynamicism about these organisms that are important. And we have to capture to really understand what's going on with these things. We want to know from a particular sample, from a particular cell, from a particular stage in life, not only not what are the set of possible things that proteins that were being made, but what proteins were actually being made. Okay, how much of them are for each of these genes? How much they turned on or turned off? And the experimental technology for doing that historically, I'll say historically, meaning ten years. Okay, has been a technology called a microarray. And so I'd like to now start talking about this other technology, which lends itself to large amounts of data, quite different than the kind of data that we've been looking at, and a variety of computational problems that are interesting there. Any questions about that? Okay, so that's sort of the transition. This stuff should look quite different than hidden Markov models. Normally I'd like to have it be in a different class, but we're a little bit behind. Any questions? Okay. So what is a, um, you know, what is a microarray, okay? What, if you believe my segue, what we would like to be able to do is to conduct a laboratory exp um, t that we, we have this idea that genes are turned on and turned off at different times to determine how much protein they're making. Um, we would like to be able to figure out how much of a protein is being made. Okay, and historically there were sort of rel relatively tedious experiments that biologists could do to measure the expression of a particular gene. If you want to know how much of one protein is there, you could do it, but it would involve a fair amount of laboratory work. What a microarray does 
enables us to sort of do experiments that will tell you all of the genes in an organism, okay? How much protein is being made? Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so the interesting thing is it's a, it's a technology for assessing um, large-scale, uh, you, know, you know, organism differences. So what it really is, is a way to think of it is that there is a microarray is a plate, okay, a little piece of glass, where what they do is they, they put down individual spots, each spot of which we can think of as being one of these individual chemical reactions that could assay the presence or a, the, the, the activity of a particular gene, okay? And if you can build one of these things on a small piece of glass, this is a very good thing to do. Because you could do one experiment on, over, on um, you know, and pour the results of that experiment all over all these cells. If each cell assays one particular protein, how much of it is being made? By looking at the amount of stuff going on in each cell, the claim is you can figure out what's going on for all the proteins in the organism. Okay? And there's ways of getting sort of large amounts of data. So wh what I'd like to do is to give you, pass out, a, um, I'd like these things back. Here are a couple of microarrays. Yeah, question. Assay was an assay is an experiment. An assay is something you do to measure something. So, um, you know, like when I, when I decide whether or not I can beat you up, I assay your strength, right? And it's a similar thing like that. I'm measuring your strength, right? I didn't think you would be deciding on that. Anyway, not that in particular. <laughs> but, but, but does everybody get the idea? Assay means a, a measurement of something. So here are some microarrays. And I'm going to pass these around. I do want them back. Um, each of them are, uh, you know, they are basically pieces of glass, okay, in this holster that, um, that, 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 that enable you to conduct a large number of experiments at once, okay? And so we'll talk a little bit later about what the technology is, how they work. But the way I would think about them, just on a purely abstract level, is that each spot represents a gene, okay, or, or a test of whether a particular gene or a particular DNA sequence or a particular thing is happening in the cell and how much of it is. The degree, to, the color of this spot after you do the experiment measures something of how much of that stuff is there. Okay? And the interesting thing is how many experiments you can do at once. Those, pro those probes that you're looking at now, the ones that you're picking up, did anybody touch the black part? Okay, that's good. That's, that's radioactive. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. It's not. It's just plastic. Trust me. No, it's not plastic. But each one of those things that we add in there has about a million different probes on it. Okay? So in some sense, when you do one experiment with one of these arrays, what you can find out is in, in the, the current biological system, for a hundred different sort of genes or uh, code, uh, DNA sequences, you can basically tell how much of it is turned on and how much of it is turned off. And so in some sense, the output of one of these experiments is a million numbers measuring for each of these million things how much of the stuff is, is there or is there not. Okay? And this gives you the ability to do an amazing number of different kinds of experiments. Okay? Any questions right now about what I've said? Okay? I mean, I told you how they work. They work in an interesting way, which is what I'll talk about now. But does everybody get the idea that basically they are is a measuring device? That for each of these, uh, you know, a bunch of features of biological interest, they will tell you how much it's turned on or turned off. Any questions about that? Yeah? Why does, why does it have an expiration date? Why does it have an expiration date? What, what you're holding there is actually a very, a, a pretty fancy piece of technology. It's actually, what you're holding is about a $500 item if it hadn't been used. Okay, once it's used, and read the data off it, it's worth nothing, which is why I have them, and why I'm letting you guys put your hands on them. Okay, but basically these are about $500 items, okay, and they are very sensitive. We'll talk about how they're constructed, but they're sensitive enough that you'll kind of see that, you know, they, they actually have DNA on them, okay, and very, and...
So you can kind of imagine that they go bad after a while. Okay, if you're if a box of pasta in, in your refrigerator you know, goes bad, then this can go bad. Any questions? Okay. Fair enough. So what can you do with one of these things? So a classic experiment that people did with microarrays is to figure out which genes were involved in cell division. You kind of have this idea. All of you have seen enough of these pictures where at one point there was one cell. You saw that it wiggles around, and then there's two cells, and it wiggles around, and there's four of them, right? Something has to tell the cell to divide, right? And then it's got to go through and make, you know, it's dividing, you know, it's got to make new cell walls. It's got to do a lot of things. And part of understanding how this machinery works, we'd like to know what genes are involved in cell cycle, okay? So this, rep this picture represents a, a, a very important experiment that was done in yeast to try to figure out which cells were involved in the, genes were involved in the cell cycle. The um, x-axis over here represents genes, okay? Or I guess the, uh, each row of this thing Let's think of, we're going to think of it as a table of uh, genes by um, microarrays. Okay, so this is an experiment where they used a bunch of these things, 10, 20 different microarrays. And what they did at each point was measure for every gene how turned on or turned off was it. So what did they do? They took a bunch of yeast cells, got them synchronized so they were all in the same state to start with, and then let them grow. And every 10 minutes, what they would do is reach out, pull it out a handful, okay, grind them up, extract their RNA, okay, and measure for each of the genes, okay, how, which, are, which genes had RNA that corresponded to it, okay? So the genes that were turned on there would be RNA copies of it being made. For the genes that were turned off, they weren't making copies, right? You have the idea that, again, you know, there's these messenger RNAs that are made. Turning on a gene means making these copies, right? And so what did they have? Every cell here means what was the expression of this gene at this time? Does everybody get that idea? Each row represents one microarray. So there's three microarrays floating around the room. The one you're holding was this at time zero. The one you're holding was at time 10 minutes. The next one was time 20 minutes, right? And when you do this thing, what they then did was cluster these things. That's what this tree is about, the clustering of it. And what does it show? They tried to cluster these things based on similarity. And Red would mean that the gene, green would mean that the gene was turned on much more than usual, okay? Red would mean it was turned off more than usual. It was, less, you know, expressing less than it should be, okay? And if you look at this thing, you'll see that there are a bunch of genes that are all turned off pretty much during this time. They're probably not very heavily involved with the cell cycle at all, right? Here you've got a bunch of genes all of which are turned on at about the same time. This much you can see, even though the slide is, is, is not very good. There's a lot of stray light. All these genes must have been turned on at the same time for a reason, right? They're all active at the same phase of the cell cycle. These genes are different. They're clearly being turned on a little later and left on a lot longer. Everybody get that idea? So the claim is that if you're given this kind of data, you could now figure out by clustering them and looking at where the periods of expressions are, which genes were turned on when, okay? And with, since you know, you can watch at this each 10 minutes how these genes were, how the uh, cells were dividing, you'd know at what phase of the cell process were certain genes turned on. Yes? How do you synchronize the cells? How you synchronize the cells? There are a couple of, a bunch of experimental ways you could do it. One is you sort of select them by size, okay? So you kind of imagine having a machine. There's a machine that will go and sort the cells based on size. And if you're a baby, I mean, if we, if we took a bunch of people in the city and we sorted them by size, what would the smallest sized people be? Babies. Babies, right? And so therefore they're all synchronized by age. Does that make sense? And now if you want to conduct an experiment, what is it like, you know, for, for you know, 
to develop over time. If we took the humans and we sorted, the, you know, sifted them out and put the, kept the smallest ones and then charted them, we have them sort of synchronized by size. That's basically what they do. Okay? There's other methods that they can do it, but I think that's the easiest to explain. Any questions? Okay? So the interesting thing here is now you've got a massive amount of data and you can tell which genes are being turned on and turned off at the time. Any questions? Does this make sense? What do the rectangles mean on top? What do these rectangles mean on top? These rectangles we will talk about more, um, probably starting next class, when we talk about clustering. Okay? What this is showing is a, the clustering, basically, of these rows. Each column, remember, represented a gene. What we would like to do is to organize them based on similarity. The similar expression profiles mean they're turned on and turned off at the same time, right? So this is representing a clustering where we are um, going to take the two most similar genes and merge them together, okay? And that sort of uh, creates like a tree of merging. Does everybody see that idea? And the height, so, so e the height of these merge steps represents how different were the sides that they were merging, right? So all over through this part, you'll see these merges are all very, very low, caught, right? That's because each one of these is very similar to its neighbor, right? So we merge, merge, merge. At some point, we decide to merge this group of things to this group of things, and they're not so similar. Does everybody agree that we branched out? That represents a higher branch. Okay, and so the height of these things, it's sort of this tree is a tree of merging. Okay, they're not rectangles, but it's a tree. Okay, and the height of the edge represents how different was the stuff on this side than another side, right? <laughs> and you'll see that all this stuff is red, all this stuff is green, it's highly different. Yeah. So, so <coughs> the binary system, is there like three different branches off of one? This is supposed to be a, uh, this should be basically binary merges. Okay, look at this binary merges. I'll claim your ternary merges are just optical illusions. Okay? So, uh, for the most part, these are binary merges. Any questions? So, this shows why clustering these things is an important problem, right? You've got his input here, 6,000 genes, each represented by 16 or 20 points, 16 or 20 dimensions. <coughs> Excuse me. What is the uh, right clustering? Any questions? Yeah. Similar as the color at the time, right? So if this was measuring basically how turned on or turned off you were, right? Okay? If we think about it as a student, how turned on or turned off are you, right? These guys are all being turned on and turned off at the same time, right? They're excited about being in computational biology. The class is dull. They take the computational biology class and they get excited, and then the class ends, and they go back to a non-excited state, right? <laughs> so you guys, if we clustered you, you would have a similar excitement profile here, right? And that would be one way if I took all the CS students and I measured your excitement level and clustered them. Perhaps we would be able to figure out a cluster would represent who was in a class at the same time, right? Or who took similar courses. And that's the kind of thing that you might show up by clustering this kind of data. Any questions? Okay. There are lots of different things that you can do with these things. One thing you can do, um, I just think which, uh, what I want to explain here. Um, there, a, another sort of related application, maybe we'll talk about some more about some of these applications. One of these applications, uh, uh, a similar, let's say, application where clustering is a big deal, uh, has to do with analyzing cancer data, OK? So if we want to try to figure this out, um, you could imagine that in a cancerous cell, things are quite different than in a non-cancerous cell, right? OK, cancerous cells divide much more rapidly. They're genetically quite different than damage. Okay, I know we went to a talk about cancer earlier in, in the year. But what you could imagine is a world where if you sampled, if you want to understand how cancer works, you could take a bunch of tissue samples of people who have cancer, a bunch of tissue samples of people who don't, 
and then measure how much of the genes are turned on or turned off from that. Does that make sense? Now for each, instead of just looking at the cell and, and saying, oh, it looks cancerous. Now for each of the genes, each of the million spots that you have there, okay, on your arrays, each of, let's say, the 25,000 human genes, you might be able to figure out which ones are turned on and which ones are turned off, right, in the cancer cell and in the normal tissue, right? And what might you hope to learn from this? One is, if you cluster the cancer patients and the human pa and the normal patients, you would hope to see some kind of interesting phenomena. You'd hope to see that the normal people, the normal tissues, fall on a different side of the clustering than the cancer stuff, right? That would mean that the cancer cell samples were more like each other than they were like the normal things. And maybe you would discover things like maybe there's two different cancer subtypes, right? You, let's say, you get can liver cancer, okay? Just getting liver cancer doesn't tell, completely describe the type of disease. Maybe there's two different types of liver cancer that work quite differently. Maybe one type responds to a drug and one type doesn't, okay? It would be very, very interesting for you to figure out which type of liver cancer you have to, let's say, help this figure out what might be the right treatment. Does this make sense? So there are a lot of things that we might want to do with uh, uh, genetics and cancer, okay? We might want to be able to try to figure out, um, you know, again, uh, discover different variations of cancer, discover that there are two different types of liver cancer. That might fall out of just a cluster analysis. We also might want to be able to diagnose you. Now suppose, let's say, you have just been diagnosed with something. I give you your, or better than that, I just want to figure out whether you have liver cancer. What might be one way I could do it? I could take your liver, a sample of your liver, run that through on a microarray, right? What would be the computational problem I now need to solve to figure out whether you have um, liver cancer or not? Clustering. Clustering. It's not quite clustering. Determining which class. Determining which class this new array is in, right? Yeah. Maybe I might want to find which is the, you know, which cluster? There's now three kinds of clusters we seemingly have. Normal, liver A, liver B, right? I want to now know where do you belong in this spectrum, right? If hopefully you belong here. If not, hopefully you belong in the one that responds to the drug, right? Okay? The claim is that this is now a problem of something like finding, it's now classifying an example given a bunch of other examples, okay? And so we're given high dimensional data and we want to try to figure this kind of stuff out. Any questions? Okay. Simil yeah, what? Do we do computation or do we do it using those Markov models? Well, there's nothing to do with Markov models now. Okay, Re recognize that. This has nothing to do with Markov models. Completely different. Okay? The problem here is now, notice we're given different data. Are we given sequence data from this at all? Let's think about it. You're no longer being given sequence data. Sequence data is completely out of our life now, right? Now what you're given instead is data about basically a vector of numbers. Okay? Each microarray was an array of numbers, right? And now each number would correspond to like a dimension. And the question is now, given these high dimensional data sets, what can we learn and do with it? Okay? So it's quite a different set of problems than what we've been talking about before. Any questions? Okay. Um, let me talk a little bit about how these things work. Okay. Do I have how much time? I have about five minutes. Let me tell you at least a li how, how these uh, microarrays work. Okay. The, um, the basic way that they're doing, what they basically do, okay, is uh, has to do with this DNA hybridization that we talked about. Remember that A's like to bind with T's and C's like to bind with G's, right? What if we built what, what, what if we built an array of molecules where we grew like here a bunch of molecules that said A, T, T, C 
And here we grew over here a bunch of molecules that were CGTT. Right? Now, suppose that these molecules are nailed onto a plate on one side. That's the sort of uh, glass that they're attached to. And now I wash over this a piece of DNA that has the pattern TAAG, okay, in it. What would we expect to happen if I have an array of these molecules grown tethered to a plate? And I pour over it a sample, okay, of DNA, a pattern like this. What would we expect is going to happen? It would stick, right? Because you'll notice this TAACG is is the reverse complement of this thing. Does that make sense? Okay. So what we would kind of expect is if we make have a lot of RNA or D, you know let's say D, you know DNA RNA for us right now let's call it the same. Okay it would stick to the, the complementary sequence, okay, of the hair that we're growing. Does that kind of make sense? So what these microarrays really are, are arrays of patches of molecules, where in each patch, the sequences of them, their DNA molecules, each of which have exactly the same pattern, each of which is nailed down in a particular spot on the array. Does that make sense? Now, if I have a, a DNA sample that I want to try to understand, maybe from your liver, okay? What I would do is I would take all the RNA, DNA in your liver, okay, in the liver cell that I got, okay? I would chop it into pieces, and I would radioactively label it, let's say, okay? Then what would happen, if I pour this over the array, what's going to happen? The places where there are complementary sequences, will bind. Does everybody agree with that? I will see it because this will now be radioactive or fluorescently labeled. There's different ways you can label it. But the basic idea is now I, you see that I have a way of detecting these things. Give me a way of measuring how much RNA there is that binds to each particular pattern. How much of that RNA there is of that type in my sample. Okay? And if you can believe I can build these arrays, should be able to believe I can measure how much stuff I'm getting, how turned on or turned off, how much RNA there is in the sample. Any questions? Okay. Yes. Each of those spots corresponds to a, what it really corresponds to is a DNA, is a uh, set of hairs, okay, a set of DNA molecules, okay? that are all identical. And so I can make it correspond to whatever I want, right? If I can grow these hairs to specification, then if let's say you want one of these spots to correspond to a gene, how could I do it? If the genomic, de if your genome desequence, if I know that there is a gene here, maybe I will find a sequence in this gene that is unique, that doesn't occur anywhere else on the genome. Right? If I now synthesize the reverse complement of it as hairs for this thing, right? Now then, whenever there is an RNA molecule copying this thing, basically, it will bind to that spot, right? So that's how I build a probe that is specific for a particular gene. Does that make sense? So typically, the length of these sequences I'm building on the array are relatively small, okay? 